Hello, everybody, and welcome to We Measure the World, a podcast produced by scientists for scientists. Yeah, so if, if you're not familiar with brood X cicadas, um, they come out of the ground every 17 years. And it, it, these, are not, these are not flies. These are several inches in length and a half an inch. Um, so they come out every 17 years. And essentially what happens is when they come out, they leave these gigantic holes in the ground about the size of a dime. And, and the, these burrows go about, they can go up to 60 centimeters deep. Um, so they can go relatively deep. So they emerge um, from the soil. They make their way up the tree. They'll mate on the tree. And then the larvae or nymphs will fall to the ground, dig into the soil, and they stay there for 17 years. Um, so the research question was essentially um, how does this, how do these burrows affect infiltration? That's a small taste of what we have in store for you today. We Measure the World explores interesting environmental research trends, how scientists are solving research issues, and what tools are helping them better understand measurements across the entire soil plant atmosphere continuum. Today's guest is Darren Ficklin. Darren Ficklin is an associate professor in the Department of Geography at Indiana University. He received his bachelor's in geological sciences there at Indiana University and then went on to get his master's in geology at Southern Illinois University and a PhD in hydrologic sciences at the University of California, Davis. After completing his PhD, he stayed in California and did postdoctoral work at Santa Clara University. His current research focuses primarily on the intersection of hydrology and climate. And today he's here to talk about his many research projects into watershed and soil hydrology, climate change, and bugs. So, Darren, thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right. So, yeah, today we wanted to talk about a few of your projects and research interests. But first, can you tell us a little bit about your background and and then how you became involved in hydrology? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, so, I'm I'm from Indiana originally. Uh, I'm from about an hour south, and I, I grew up in, in farmland. Um, and I've always been interested in science. Uh, I have no idea why. Um, so I mean, some of these older older folks listening remember Mr. Wizard, uh, mm -hmm. Bill Nye. Mm -hmm. I watch those all mm -hmm. the time. I remember as a young kid um, mixing mayonnaise and ketchup and mustard and making my own chemical chemical uh, chemical concentrations there and, and doing some weird stuff with that. But I've, I've, so I've always been interested in science. I I don't know really what happened with that. Um, and as I grew older, I got to kind of um, be in the environment more. And so my dad worked for the USDA um, in RCS as a, uh, a so mm -hmm. uh, soil scientist. Uh, specifically mm -hmm. what he did is he helped farmers around the region um, limit erosion. So that, I think mm -hmm. that kind of steered me in the direction of, of the environmental science. Um, and that was, that was essentially, I, I, was, I was too young to know what that was, but as I grew up in high school, I kind of kind of understand of you know, what you can do in the environment. Um, I was also really into computers uh, at, in, at the high school. I didn't understand them. Um, in fact, I went to Indiana University and I was originally a computer science major. Um, mm -hmm. And they threw me into a sophomore level course and I had no idea what I was doing almost immediately. So that was, they threw me in and I was, they were coding on the first day. So I did not understand mm -hmm. what computer science was at, at that age. So I, I dropped that almost immediately. Um, I talked to the advisor, uh, one of the academic advisors at IU, and, and they, they kind of steered me into this inter introductory geology course. Um, mm -hmm. And that was it. That, that basically, I took off from there. I really, really enjoyed it. And then I, as I took more and more classes, I, I, I took more hydrology classes in the upper levels. And that's really when I, when I took off as far as I was interested in hydrology. And I, I think a lot of that stemmed from my you know, farming background and my dad's work with the, uh, the USDA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess that, that's kind of fun. This is one of the things that, that we hear often is that either, yeah, uh, the the folks that are now in their specialties they are um, quite often didn't start <laughs> where where they thought or didn't end up where they thought they would end up um, starting w with one thing moving on to another uh, so going from computer science um, so then did with your computer science background and then geology so uh, I, I'm assuming that that GIS then became kind of one of your one of your go tos to yeah. connect the two yeah so uh, at undergraduate I started taking a lot of GIS courses as well. Um, that was mm -hmm. junior, senior level courses, and specifically they were geological applications in GIS. 
um, where you would work on, I'd work on my own erosion processes on a, on a hill slope. Um, so that type mm -hmm. of stuff, where, you know, really kind of kind of gelled everything together for me, uh, the computer science aspect. Yeah, I didn't understand that computer science was coding um, at, <laughs> at that time. I, I, I learned yeah. very quickly. I mean, now I can code, but I didn't, didn't understand it when I was entering the undergraduate uh, curricula. Right. right. Um, well, let's talk, uh, let's dive into some of your uh, current research and or more recent research. Um, a lot of a lot of what you've been working with, um, especially within the realm of hydrology, is hydrology and uh, hydroclimatology and and those kinds of the, the interplay between between climate change and variability and hydro hydrological processes. Um, can you? Uh, g I guess how did how did you go from from being uh, you know working with? Uh, w uh, let me back that up. So how did you come to to focus more on? Uh, on this, this I, I guess this interplay, the, the integration between climate and hydrology. Yeah. So my master's was in groundwater, groundwater hydrology. Mm -hmm. My PhD was in surface hydrology. So a lot of those are treated separately. They should not be treated separately, but a lot of them are treated separately. So that kind of gave me a little more general idea of the hydrological cycle. And, and as far as climate change goes, that really started when I was out in California. Um, get my PhD, and it really started. Uh, you don't, I don't realize this in the in when you're in the Midwest, but California exists because of its snow melt, snowpack. Mm -hmm. um, and I was really interested in how climate change was affecting uh, the, those variables. So that's kind of what initially got me going on that. Um, and then I took that a little step further and kind of worked on the agricultural aspect of, of climate change, specifically looking at water quality. Um, right. I was looking at nitrates, pesticide runoff in the Central Valley of California. And then that kind of led me directly into my postdoctoral work, which, which was mainly on, on stream temperature, um, mm -hmm. largely mm -hmm. due because of, of, of the, the, the important aquatic species out west, salmon, trout, right. um, that depend right. on a particular, a particular stream temperature to, to exist. Right. I, I'm interested in uh, definitely in the... The, the issues around hydrology within the Intermountain and Arid West. I mean, that's that's kind of a big deal now, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it has been for a while. You know, ever since uh, ever since people started living there. You know, uh, water is is a a scarce resource um, in those more arid environments, and especially like what you were talking about with um, uh, being dependent on on snowmelt on that snowpack um, for for that runoff for um, recharge um, for all those other things that, that we're dealing with what are some of the the questions that you're interested in and, and maybe some of the the things that you learned in in researching particularly with in dealing with with uh, um, kind of those those more snow dependent mm -hmm. regions well it, when you add climate change to the mix it's, it's not not pretty right so yeah. the, the snowpack you know, barely exists depending on what uh, what climate change your projection you you're looking at and working on uh, the the snowpack barely exists um, at the end of the century right and that's largely due to mm -hmm. air temperature um, air temperature it's precipitation falls at either snow or rain right snow or rain and right. air, when you have a higher temperature it's more likely to fall as as rain and then you put that on an existing snowpack that wipes mm -hmm. it out pr uh, pretty quickly so so that's uh, We've done work in the Sierra, uh, the Columbia, and the Colorado, and they're they're all basically mm -hmm. telling you the exact same thing. You know, when you increase mm -hmm. air temperature, and and even when when precipitation is is held steady compared to historical rates, snowpack still goes down. Um, right. Yeah. So that's that's generally a conclusion, and that's that's not a new conclusion. There have been plenty of people um, looking at that and still looking at that, and specifically how these dynamics are going to change, and whether these models can capture these dynamics, and then the, you add the whole reservoir management aspect of that which i, I don't mm -hmm. do but how are you going to manage mm -hmm. no water or, or lack of water right. when when to release this water for agricultural right. irrigation and environmental flows it's 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 ex extremely complicated right and yeah i mean personally speaking i've i've been interested in in the uh the i guess the plight of the great salt lake here in in the west um and that specifically it, when you're talking about like yeah reservoir management or in dealing with uh, snowpack um, there in the uh, in the the Rockies there nearby they had a bunch of snow so to back this up the Great Salt Lake has been decreasing the the, the uh, water level has been decreasing for 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 years um, for various reasons climate change among them um, but then also they're having a they had a huge snowfall this winter 
and expecting a huge snow snowpack. But then we're dealing with uh, climate variability. So then you have a lot of snow, but then the next week it's, you know, 80 degrees Fahrenheit and you're having all of that snow that's supposed to be getting packed down is melting. And then you're dealing with floods and, right. and other things like that. And so then, you know, the lake level will rise for a little while. But but again, that that idea, like you said, that long term of the hydrology of that region, of that basin region, um, does not look uh, very good mm. right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I did my uh, postdoctoral project. One of my projects during my postdoctoral work was on Mono Lake in the eastern, oh, yeah. eastern Sierras. And the issue of, of that is, is still snowpack as well. But uh, the, the main issue was that LA went up and grabbed all of the water mm -hmm. entering entering Mono Lake. Now there, there's been mm -hmm. some some laws to kind of uh, kind of move that back um, to a more reasonable um, allotments, but it's still it's the same it's the same issue there where the snowpack feeds the small creeks that enter Mono Lake, and when they when they mm -hmm. don't have water, you expose the lake bed, which is salty and briny, and lots of like Salt Lake City has it as well, right? Where you get these wind storms yeah. and it just yeah asthma. Yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah, yeah. Wind storms, you have an inversion that then keeps all that that air pollution down, all that kind of stuff as well. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's something that we've seen throughout throughout the world. I mean, yeah, especially there in California, Mono Lake, Owens, uh, Salton Sea, and then elsewhere, you have you know the Aral Sea. It's it's probably that the the most well known one worldwide, mm -hmm. um, where you have that just decrease in in that inflow, um, and and then just uh, yeah. Everything kind of goes to pot after that. Yeah. It's, it's tough to come back from that. Um, and I, it's one of those things where, um, where yeah, change. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to be, you know, Debbie Downer about this, but a lot of times change doesn't happen until it's right there in your face. And then, and then oftentimes it's too late. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't know. Well, it, it, it's hard to tell farmers you can't have that water. Yeah. So, yeah. Just, yeah. When they've had it for so long. I, I think it, I think I remember hearing and and um, and I hope I'm correct on this. I don't want to say anything, but but that uh, therefore the Great Salt Lake, the I think about 80 percent of the water uh, that comes off is being pulled for agricultural use, uh, something along those yeah. lines as and 20 percent for uh, for other, you know, mm -hmm. uh, industrial or urban or residential use. Yeah. Um, and so that that is a difficult situation to find yourself in, um, is especially as a farmer, grower, producer, um, where n you know now I can't do what I've I've been doing or what my family has been doing for generations because you know some outside you know outside source is telling me you know uh, that I'm using too much water. Uh, I've got water rights, and I don't want to go into all <laughs> that stuff. But but it's definitely something that here in the Intermountain West, arid West, it's it's something that is of of, of within yeah prioritize discussions and yeah well that that's not going away i mean i know california yeah. is doing a big groundwater management groundwater recharge management uh they're putting a lot of money in, into that um so it's mm -hmm. there's there's a lot of money out the west to understand these problems and um, yeah it's, they're not stopping have you have you gotten into any any kind of um involvement with uh with policymakers when it comes to um uh water use or, or management practices no, no, I haven't. Uh, that's something I, I would like to do. Um, we have a, a great school on campus, uh, School of Public and Environmental Affairs. They do a lot of environmental policy, and I do have col colleagues that work with, with policymakers, but it's something that I haven't really um, reached out and, and done yet. It, it's, it's something that's needed, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, I guess, recent or current uh, project on, uh, funded by the, the USGS on rain on snow events? Mm -hmm and looking into those. What have you found with that? What was, what was your primary questions going into to that project and what have you been finding with, with that? Yeah, so um, that project, I had a PhD student here at, at IU that graduated and is now at the Stroud Water Center out, in, out mm -hmm. on the East Coast. Um, and he got the interest of, of looking at rain on snow, but not in the Western United States to where rain on snow is, is really studied you know, a lot or quite well. Mm -hmm. We're looking at the Great Lakes um, where okay. there's a lot of snow, uh -huh. a lot of snow in the Great Lakes, but rain on snow isn't really looked at there. Uh, and we know that rain on snow causes flooding um, up, up in the Great right. Lakes. It happens it happens frequently. So we're kind of taking what we've learned and what we've done with the Western United States and, and moved it up to the Great Lakes Basin, which needs some studying as well. And the main questions uh, was essentially what's rain on snow doing in the future? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then what we're working on right now 
is what's rain on snow doing to water temperatures and how is that's going to affect um, aquatic species. Uh, Michigan is, is throwing a lot of money into these species that they're introducing up up in northern Michigan. The Ar Arctic grayling is, is one of them that they're trying to get back. Uh, it's been there and they're trying to make it uh, make its uh, a successful return. Um, mm -hmm. So with all of this, we're working with these, these tribes in, in northern Michigan um, to help disseminate this type of information. So we're a year into this project. Uh, we've got an, uh, roughly another year to go. Um, right now we're doing a lot of computational work um, to try to get everything uh, ready to go so that we can start mm -hmm. analyzing the data, start inputting climate scenarios and, and summarizing right. all of this info. So what are, what are some of your primary hypotheses then that you're, you're uh, testing or looking at with this? So th with the rain on snow stuff, we assume that rain on snow is going to decrease. Mm -hmm. right? you, that's not what you would necessarily think, but when you have, mm -hmm. uh, and we actually, what we found in Northern Great Lakes Basin, it increases in the Southern Great Lakes Basin, it decreases the rain on snow events. Mm -hmm. And largely because you don't, in the Southern portion of the Great Lakes Basin, you don't have any snow and you need right. rain to occur on snow for a rain on snow event right. to happen. So <laughs> right. while, while uh, we are warming, in the in the southern great in the southern Great Lakes basins, southern Michigan, uh, northern Indiana, northern Great Lakes basins up Lake Lake Superior, there's still going to be snow there. Um, right. So what we're seeing is that there's going to be a, an increase in rain on snow events, so flooding, for example, and on the southern portion we're seeing a decrease in rain on snow. And, and right now we're looking at these implications of of what that does to to stream temperatures. Uh, so mm -hmm. the hypothesis for the water temperature aspect is if you don't have a snowpack to cool the water temperatures. All right. So if you think about a snowpack that just slowly slowly melts, you're you're constantly inputting cold water into your stream. What happens mm -hmm. when that's gone? Um, mm -hmm. What happens to the water temperatures when those gone? Can these trout, which are trout and salmon, which are really economically important for this entire Great Lakes Basin, what happens? Are they, are they able to migrate out of there? Uh, are they right. even able to exist? Uh, we know that they're going to be stressed out, but how stressed out are they? Um, so that's kind of the general hypothesis is when you don't have snow, what happens? Right. Yeah. Right. Um, with that, so you're primarily looking at, at those those fish species. Um, is there a concern with the plant community or other you know uh, or other organisms as well that that as you know again is are, are you seeing the you know trout and others as kind of like the the harbinger or canary in the coal mine of, of how things the rest of the the uh, ecosystem might might react to this change. I don't know much about the plant communities, but if you think about mm -hmm. warmer waters, they're usually more productive. Um, right. So what that brings in, I, I don't know, invasives. Uh, there's, there's a whole question of right. on, on the plant community that I, I, I'm not an expert on. We were looking right. at trout and salmon because that's when you think of these ideal extremes in northern Michigan, they're <laughs> trout and salmon streams. That's, what, it's, that's right. what people spend a lot of money to go up and do. So we're looking at those. Uh -huh. And the tribes that we're working with on, on, on that particular project, uh, they're, they're very interested in as well as far as mm -hmm. uh, these in the, the, the fish species. Right. And is, it, is there a concern with, uh, you mentioned invasive species, is there a concern with invasive uh, fish species, or is it mainly just the decrease in the, the trout and salmon? So, so something we will be able to do is see if, uh, if invasive fish species are able to live. Uh, we will we'll have a whole, a whole ensemble of stream flows and, and water temperatures, and we'll be able to say which species can survive there. Because generally we know um, what fish species like, what they don't like, mm -hmm. so we could develop all these scenarios. And um, uh, there's a lot of invasive talk in, in Lake Michigan all the time um, right. with all of these Asian carps, uh, whether right. they can eventually yeah. make it in there um, or not. Um, so it's something that we could do um, and something that we, we probably should do in the end as well to see if, if these invasive species are able to even survive there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what, what are some of the, uh, I guess, uh, parameters? What are some of the, the, the data that you're collecting um, in order to, um, and to, to model and forecast uh, going forward? Yeah, so this is, the, we work with a hydrological model. And if you're not familiar with hydrological models, just think of it as a big bunch of equations that all talk to each other, right? And the general yeah. input to these equations are precipitation, temperature, and then the model essentially tries to figure out what happens with the water as it goes through the landscape. Um, mm -hmm. That's generally what these models do. Um, the model that we're working with, which is the soil uh, and, and water assessment tool, which is a, an open source model, it uses a lot of GIS layers. 
Um, it uses a lot of uh, the equations that I mentioned. Um, so that's what we're kind of working with for this model, uh, for this, this project. Um, and we collect a lot of observations, but most of these observations have already been collected by the USGS, uh, the EPA. We're also working in mm -hmm. Canada some because Great Lakes go up there. So we're using Canadian mm -hmm. data, but largely the data that we use for this for this large scale project, the data already exists. So that, that makes our lives a lot easier. Um, and because it's an open source model, we can do a lot of different things with it. So if one example that we did implement rain on snow into this model, which it did not do earlier. So mm -hmm. we can we can test a lot of these different hypotheses using this this large scale model. Right. And so um, there's a the I guess a separate maybe connected project in that was funded by the NSF with uh, uh, with HydroClimb. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, getting data from yeah high resolution stream flow water temperature, GIS modeling, all that kind of stuff. Can you connect it or, or go into a little bit more detail about what's going on with that with that project? Yeah, I mean, it's essentially the same. We're developing these large scale models for all of the all of North America. Um, mm -hmm. um, and, and essentially what we're producing and what we've already produced is a, a database of water temperatures and stream flows in the future um, mm -hmm. for essentially every, let's say every big water body in North America. Um, so we developed a, a website to where the user can go and click on a particular watershed or basin, and they can download mm -hmm. essentially 1950 to 2100 uh, projections of water temperature and stream wow. flow at the monthly time step. We're in the middle of writing this, what they call a data paper up. Uh, we're in the middle of writing this right now where it's essentially going to be introduced to the community where they can start using it. But the methods that I just mentioned in the, in the previous project, it, it's the same methods, just really big scale. So in both of these projects, we're using supercomputers to do this. Otherwise, uh, you know, the desktops that we're talking on, uh, not able to do that type of computational work. Right, right. And with with a lot of this, this modeling into stream flow and temperature, um, I guess you have some other publications, um, even more recently in, uh, in Nature Water, mm -hmm. um, dealing with the impacts of from what you're finding I, i'm assuming this is what from your finding from these these models and from current uh uh current research and the impacts and and the implications for for uh yeah water resource management mm -hmm. and and other things can you go into a bit more detail about about that yeah so i took a sabbatical last spring and during that time i was in england um, and i was working mm -hmm. with some colleagues in england and we all essentially got together um, these are all water temperature people. Um, we all mm -hmm. we all got together. We figured out, you know, what don't we know about water temperature? And when we look, started looking back at the literature, we noticed that a lot of the water temperature studies that are they assume natural conditions, um, or they're on these these northern Canadian rivers, Scottish Scottish mm -hmm. rivers that are just like perfect rivers, um, <laughs> right. which if you go south in, in latitude, those don't exist anymore. Right. And yeah. so what we thought is like, you know, we need to know more about what's happening with water temperature in urban landscapes when you have pipes mm -hmm. and when you or, or agricultural landscapes. And we right. have an NSF funded right. project going on right now where we're looking at the influence of tile drainage on, on water temperatures oh, as well. So we really want to understand what water temperature is doing in these really mucked up environments where right. we barely understand the hydrology. Um, and we want to know what the hydrology is doing to, to the water temperatures and what, what we've, what we're doing and what that nature water paper kind of calls out is for just, we need more observations in these regions where we don't know anything mm -hmm. about, um, mm -hmm. in, in the most screwed up environments, look through some observations and see how water temperatures react to precipitation events or heat waves or droughts. Cause we right. really don't know what's going on in these really, really managed systems. Right. Um, with with that, how are you going about? Um, I guess just from a, a so we we talked about the modeling, but but even just on kind of boots on the ground type of uh, field research, how are you going about uh, collecting uh, the data for uh, you know, for instance, it looking at at tile drainage mm -hmm. um, effects on on stream temperature? Yeah, we we spent uh, a month in, uh, this summer going out and deploying water temperature sensors all over the Midwest. Um, and we specifically selected basins that have not much tile drainage and, and basins that have a lot of tile drainage. And we kind of installed these, these water temperature sensors along the spectrum of, of no tile drainage to a lot of tile drainage. Um, mm -hmm. uh, those, are, those are taking data right now, I hope. Um, 
They, so we will, that, that's one thing we're doing is we're, we're going out and we've installed 20 and we're probably going to install five to 10 more sensors. So we're going to have a lot of data, hopefully right now, but we're going to go ahead and collect it more in the fall. Um, and we're going to use this information, to try to understand what these agricultural practices are doing for water temperature. Um, right, and if you're not right. familiar with tile drainage, it's, it's all over the Midwest. Um, and, and we don't, we know how, what tile drainage does to water quality. That's really well mm -hmm. studied, but not not necessarily a water temperature, which is kind of right. determines water quality as those as well. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I was going to say, I probably should have, should have backed this up a little bit. Could you get, go into a little, <laughs> into uh, maybe not too much depth, but could you just explain uh, tile drainage and how it's, mm. how it's used within the agricultural settings? Yeah. Tile drainage uh, is essentially pipes underneath the landscape, underneath agricultural mm -hmm. landscapes. And it's essentially what it is, is it keeps the groundwater table from coming up to the surface and, mm -hmm. and, and it, it drains any water that comes in contact with it. So it's a perforated pipe. And that perforated pipe collects uh, soil moisture, it collects groundwater, and it takes the, those pipes, essentially it's a highway for water, and it takes it to the nearest water body. And that, that's mm -hmm. an agricultural ditch or a river. Mm -hmm. So you can see how this would affect, would affect water quality. But, but right. the goal of, of tile drainage is to keep your soil from being uh, waterlogged, um, either from groundwater or soil moisture. Um, any water that intersects it, it's essentially gone because the, the, right. the pipes are perforated. Um, right. So that's that's kind of why the Midwest is is uh, is so agriculturally uh, um, productive. Uh, most of northern mm -hmm. Indiana was a wetland at one point, and when you throw tiles mm -hmm. in a wetland, <laughs> they're gone essentially. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it's all yeah. over the place. So interesting. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, along with that, are you are you uh, measuring um, any kind of other um, issues with water quality? So you talked about, I mean, you're focusing on temperature, but but anything other, you know, other chemicals, you know, nitrates or pesticides or other things like that. Not really any chemicals other than water temperature. Okay. I, I'm not a I'm not a water chemist, so I don't I don't have okay. a I don't have a wet lab. I can understand water temperature. That makes sense. Um, right. My PhD student right now is getting his PhD. In, 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 in geography, but his dissertation is on how tile drainage affects hydrology. Um, and mm. Specifically, he's looking at uh, the flashiness of stream flow, how fast mm -hmm. the hydrograph goes up and then goes down. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, he started to look at how tile drainage affects drought, whether these tile drainage mm -hmm. drained watersheds are more susceptible to drought um, than, than their counterparts without much tile drainage. So we're, we're looking at the hydrology aspect as well. Um, we have, mm -hmm. I have uh, several new students coming in in the fall that will probably more along. They'll take the water temperature work um, and move right, that forward. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I know that uh, you had some other, uh, some other uh, research um, looking into uh, hydrological intensification mm -hmm. um, and, and just how that might impact uh, water resource management. Um, just dealing with with precipitation events and their duration, their um, uh, their their size. Um, can you go into uh, explain a little bit about that that uh, project there? Yeah. So d defining hydrological densification is essentially too much water and then not enough <laughs> water. So mm -hmm. it's it's exactly what has been happening in California, where they've been having this drought, 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 and then they got huge snowpack. Right. right. If, you, if you think about how to manage reservoirs with no water. And then you get a lot of water. Do you release that water um, mm -hmm. into the streams, or do you need to back that water right. up in case for the next drought um, right. to store that water? So there's kind of a you got it, it's it's a complex decision um, whether they need to do uh, release the water, store the water. So that's essentially what that project looks at, and it it, it basically looks at extreme precipitation events and then how long between the next one. Um, so one thing we expect with climate change is extreme precipitation events, and then a dry period between them. Um, so that's kind of um, what that study is looking at. And we did, we did a lot of climate models and we looked at what's going on throughout the world, specifically tying that into how you can manage that with water and how, mm -hmm. how you can manage that with uh, reservoirs. Right, right. Yeah, I know going back to California, I know they've, I mean, with excess water, they've been, we've got Tulare Lake, that's back again. It's a lake. <laughs> It's now a lake. It's a lake now. It's it's a lake. It, it was a lake, and then it wasn't a lake, and now it's a lake again. Um, and, and again, going back to, yeah, uh, water issues in in the arid west, um, and uh, especially with with agricultural uh, side of things. Yeah, there's there's a lot of issues. And I, I mean, uh, again, it's it's one of these things where where we see this, um, 
like you're saying, we, we see this in these particular regions, but but then these are just kind of uh, uh, prototypical of what what the potential is elsewhere uh, throughout the world as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's just that the Western United States is, and, and other arid regions are just completely dependent on reservoirs. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what are, what are I mean, did you come up with any uh, suggestions for um, for water management? I mean, you talked about uh, reservoir management or other things like that. So I worked with uh, Sarah Knoll out of the Utah State, and she that's that's her specialty. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we don't have many good recommendations other than that, you know, you kind of need to start thinking about this. Um, mm -hmm. planning out really ext extreme scenarios of what happens when you have a, a really wet year and then five dry years behind it. And, you know, you, they need to kind of run these in their, in their models, these reservoir management models to see, you know, what are we going to do? How, how can we do this? Um, or at least, at least start thinking about this stuff. I mean, I, hopefully California right. now is in the Western US, United States now is, is thinking about this, but, you know, maybe start implementing some policies in case this happens again. Right, right. All right. Well, let's switch gears here a little bit um, and talk about bugs. Um, yeah. And I know this isn't your, your main specialty, but um, yeah, I, I was going to say, uh, did you ever think that you would be an entomologist? No, no. <laughs> I have so to pretend to be one. So <laughs> but yeah, let's talk about let's talk about brood X cicadas and their emergence in 2021. Yeah. So if, if you're not familiar with brood X cicadas, um, they come out of the ground every 17 years. And it, it, mm -hmm. these are not these are not flies. These are several inches in length and a half an inch mm -hmm. in, in width. So these are big. These are not. These are big bugs. They they can right. they can ride right. along on your hair or your back. Um, um, so they come out every 17 years. And essentially, what happens is when they come out, they leave these gigantic holes in the ground, about the size of a mm -hmm. dime. And, and the, these burrows go about. They can go up to 60 centimeters deep. Um, so they can go relatively deep. So they emerge um, from the soil. They make their way up the tree. Uh, they, they can't fly yet when they when they emerge. They eventually can when they when they break out of their shell. But they'll crawl up the tree. They'll mate on the tree, and then the larvae or nymphs will fall to the ground, dig into the soil, and they stay there for 17 years. Um, hmm. So the research question was essentially, um, how does this? How do these burrows affect infiltration? Um, right. in, infiltration rates. So. I actually did this project in 2004 as well, which was the last emergence. That oh, was really? a, that was an undergraduate project I worked on here at IU. Um, <laughs> You've come full circle. I come full circle. <laughs> and the next one is uh, the next one's 2038. Um, so I'll, I'll be ready for them. So right. essentially, what what we did for this is uh, we contacted the NSF Hydrological Sciences Program, and we said uh, we there's going to be a, a big disturbance coming. Um, mm -hmm. Can we have just a little bit of money? And what we did is we bought the, the meter group, set your units, infiltration mm -hmm. units to go mm -hmm. out and measure this. So, um, and these uh, these cicadas, there can be a million per acre. Um, so the ground looks like Swiss cheese. Um, right. And there are areas in the same landscape which may not have any, any cicadas whatsoever in them. Uh -huh. So the reason that they don't have any cicadas is maybe there was construction there between this and this, the previous 17 mm -hmm. years. So right, you, what right. you'll see is you'll see a lot of cicadas in these these this fence rows or mm -hmm. urban forests where essentially there's not been anything um, worked on in the past 17 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. um, so what we did, we took about 90 measurements uh, with, with the Satyr unit all over Bloomington. We did it in urban landscapes, in, in forested landscapes. And specifically, we had two of these units. One unit was measuring the infiltration rate where there's a lot of cicada holes, cicada burrows, mm -hmm. and the other one was mm -hmm. not, where there were no mm -hmm. cicada holes. So they were, you know, roughly two meters apart. We, we could kind of we could kind of find areas where, they, where there were no emergence holes. And what we found was that we found almost an 80% difference in infiltration rates in, in wow. forested landscapes. So they, these, these, these bugs caused a, quite a bit of an increase in infiltration. Um, we did not find any difference in, in urban landscapes though, which was which very interesting. Um, and we attribute that to, there's a lot of compaction, soil compaction in these urban landscapes. Mm -hmm. So cicadas have a rough time, I would guess, burrowing down and they'll, right. they'll tend to have shallower, shallower burrows. Um, and right. what we think is essentially, if you have shallow burrows, you can take on less water. Um, so we didn't right. actually see yeah. any difference of infiltration rates. 
Um, so that's essentially what we what we found. That that project, it, we still have a ton of data that we're working on, um, but it's officially going to wrap up this fall. So we there was an army of graduate students and undergraduate students all over Bloomington, uh, surrounded by cicadas, <laughs> uh, uh -huh. and taking all of these measurements. But it was. Uh, it was the easiest research question I have ever developed because it was it's just right it was just right there in front of us you know how, right how does there. this affect water so yeah I, I was gonna say I mean I, I want to get into to more of, of the results with uh, that hydraulic conductivity and mm -hmm. but um, but what yeah dealing with with the timing because you know that it's coming um, was it, it was it difficult to to get funding ahead of time to plan up and say hey I need it by <laughs> I need to have this ready to go by by you know what was it spring 2021 or yeah. whatever it may be yeah. um, and then and then also um, uh, secondary to that is that um, is a, is the timing within your your measurements as as well is there is there is there a timing issue where where those holes then will will fill in, yeah. um, and then you might not have the 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 right um, you know the right results that that might or I, I guess the more accurate results right. that you might get earlier on. Um, so two questions there about yeah. timing. Well, the answer is yes to both. Timing is is uh -huh. very important. So the the project the NSF project that we funded that we asked for funding was the NSF Rapid and. Rapid means uh, you don't need to go through the review, go through the program manager, and they will essentially cut you a check to do what you're requesting to do. So that process didn't take too long. Um, uh -huh. I don't remember, but a month, month and a half or so. Um, okay. That had to start in March uh, or, or mid spring to get that happen. And then essentially once right. I got the money, what I, the only hold up was um, getting the equipment to me. Um, and and oh. that that I mean that that was that was on time as well. So I got the equipment in roughly mid May, maybe late May, uh -huh. and they all uh -huh. emerged in mid May, late May. Um, so the timing it was it was kind of very important. I had to get the measurements as soon as they as soon as they got here, as soon as they emerged. Right. Um, right. But the other right. question, yeah, we had to get we had to get these measurements quick uh, because it, it was noticeable, uh, especially in the Midwest when you leaves started falling from the trees. Uh, big storms, sediment, filling it up, back up a sediment. So we wanted to get as many measurements as we could. I mean, we took 90 measurements, which was essentially five days a week uh, with four mm -hmm. or five people out in the fields. So 90 measurements is, is, is quite a bit um, for, this, for this type of work. Now, we only used about 70 because there were some issues with uh, the soil afterwards. We can go into those a little right. bit later. But um, yeah, timing. We had to get it, and we had to get all those measurements as, as quick as possible. Yeah. So yeah, so let's let's get into so um, how are you? So you talked about using the Satro mm -hmm. uh, infiltrometer. Um, mm -hmm. How are you? How are you using that? Um, how are you uh, doing your site selection? Um, yeah, could you get into just kind of the the nitty gritty uh, of how uh, the the field process works? Yeah, so we know we wanted to compare uh, the cicada infiltration rates in in forested and urban landscapes. So that that was kind okay. of criteria number one. Um, and essentially, we had a forest that we worked in, so we were pretty good there. We could we mm -hmm. could find the cicada holes, take the measurements, and then look around several meters and find an area without any cicada holes. And then we would just set these two units up at once, and they would mm -hmm. they would just be going for you know two or three hours, however long they go. Um, urban was a little harder. Uh, we mostly concentrated our measurements in in parks, um, mm -hmm. parks and lawns where we had permission to be in there taking measurements, but. Um, mm -hmm. So essentially, we needed we needed to find areas where the emergences were pretty uh, have a pretty high rate, um, right, and then right. go, and then work backwards from there. Um, okay. So that that's generally the the field work, uh, and then we would yeah we took seven we took ninety measurements in total, and we used seventy I think for the paper that was published um, in earlier this year on this. So w with that, you said you you found an eighty percent difference between the disturbed and undisturbed when it, when it comes to is that field saturated hydraulic conductivity yep, that, is that correct that's kfs yep field KFS. saturated oh, yep and um and so i guess is that what you were expecting were you expecting more or less or or is, did that sound about right uh we didn't know um, but we, we would expect that areas with high cicada emergence burrows, you would have higher infiltration rates. That makes right. sense, right? Yeah. We expected that to happen, but we did not see that in urban landscapes um, mm -hmm. for, for the reasons I previously mentioned. So the hypothesis, yeah, we, we should see higher uh, saturated hydraulic kivy rates in, in areas with, with higher emergence rates. Yeah. 
but we didn't know the percent because it's this hasn't been done. Yeah, we had no idea. How, we had no idea. You know, earthworms. I think it's ten percent. Um, okay. But this was, this was pretty. I mean, these are big holes. These aren't earthworm these are, holes. I mean, these are yeah, right. These are large macropores. Yeah. I guess one one of the other questions that I had was, um, do you see other, um, you know, macroinvertebrates like like cicadas or or any other uh, um, animals along those lines that have potentially as big as an impact as what you were seeing, uh, uh, I guess, a big as an impact on soil hydrology as what you were seeing with cicadas there? N not in this area. Mm. Not in this area. I mean, this was a really intense emergence. It's where there's right, the, yeah. the, the, the soil looked like Swiss cheese. Um, right. So, I mean, you're talking about millions per acre, right? Yeah. So, so there's nothing around here that does that. Um, uh -huh. uh, so, no, I, I think this was the... Um, this was the as as high as the KFS probably could be in, in, right. in forested landscapes, right. and so now we're right. starting to think about what are the implications of, of this type of work. Right. Yeah. And and one of the things we are looking at is is this potential what happens in underneath this groundwater, what happens right. underneath for groundwater. Um, we're, there are papers in review about what happens with soil respiration when this mm -hmm. when this happens. So carbon mm -hmm. carbon fluxes and nitrogen fluxes. Right. Um, right. So. The implications. So I kind of started out as the water person, and I'm kind of building on <laughs> what what are the implications of 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 other aspects. Right, right. Because I mean, especially with uh, you know the emergences like like these. I mean, they're huge, but they're they are only you know 17 years apart. That's that seems like a it's a it's a, a very long time when you're dealing with especially life cycles of of invertebrates. But um, um, is it is it something where where we might see, uh, I mean, I guess, man, like climate change comes into play as well, is that as the climate changes, I'm assuming that, <laughs> putting my, my fake uh, entomologist hat on, is that I'm assuming that, that this emergence is triggered by, uh, by environmental factors, um, potentially. Uh, um, I mean, for it to be 17 years, I mean, uh, for, for, other, for other emergent, you know, uh, uh, species, it's based off of, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know, degree days or other mm -hmm. things like that, where uh, where there's those internal processes that that trigger these things. Um, do you see potentially? I mean, I guess a couple questions here. Do you see climate change affecting the emergence of of cicadas? You've been you've d been doing some work in in climate change in the region, um, but then on the other side as well is that uh, could these cicadas, as as we're uh, as um, urbanization expands um, or dealing with uh, the the impacts of of you know water flow within the soil mm -hmm. um, could there be changes or future impacts uh, yeah. to any kind of degree where we we might need to mitigate or or manage the issue yeah so I, th as far as climate change they emerge when it's the soil has been 64 degrees fahrenheit for three days okay. um right. so they'll, they'll start to move up so if you want to just warm up the soil then they're going to emerge earlier right That's now right. why they come out every 17 years I, I could not find a good answer for that. Um, whether the cicadas kind of track the number of, you know, summer cycles, I, I, I don't know. I don't. I put my fake <laughs> fake entomology hat on too, and but I, I don't know why they emerge every 17 years. Um, but if you're talking about climate change, it's all dependent on soil temperature for them. Um, yeah. So warm up soil, and they're going to emerge earlier into the year. So maybe instead of mid-May, they're maybe going to move uh, early May, right? And it's going to uh -huh. going to yeah. screw up graduation around here. <laughs> the the uh, the other thing is, uh, is the nymphs essentially hang out um, in in the, like a little feeding cell, and these feeding cells are, are attached to a tree root. So cicadas have to be where trees are at all, at all times. So they they're not gonna they're not gonna emerge in the middle of a soccer field um, unless there right, was a tree right, there okay. um, 17 years Previously. ago. Right, yeah. right. So they need to be near trees because that's what they feed on the roots. So, but from our studies, we, we think you know all these deforestations, uh, suburban ho housing moving out, um, anything that's going to disturb that top of the soil column where these nymphs are hanging out right now, is going to wipe out the cicadas. Uh, they're they're mm -hmm. not going to they won't come back in these areas. And I mm -hmm. live um, in, in an old neighborhood where their cicadas were all, all over the place. And right across mm -hmm. the street was a new subdivision. There were no cicadas in that entire subdivision. Interesting. So, yeah. Yeah. so that type of land use management will certainly wipe out the cicadas. Right, right. Well, um, 
Any any other uh, interesting stories? I guess when you're dealing with with uh, bugs, there's got to be some funny stories about people getting attacked by bugs or anything yeah. like well, swarmed or anything. My <laughs> wife went grocery shopping with two cicadas on her shoulder the entire time. Uh, that was a common occurrence when you go to the grocery store during that time period. Uh -huh. Um, uh -huh. as I was walking my dog around the neighborhood, uh, I talked to another dog owner whose dog had to get their stomach pumped, um, because really? they'd eaten so many cicadas out in their yard. Oh, wow. Um, they're the moles were outrageous. Mm -hmm. I've never seen mm -hmm. more moles in my yard, um, during this mm -hmm. time period. Uh, uh, -huh. uh everyone was eating well, uh, the, right, the birds yeah. were eating well, everyone was eating well at this time period. It was, uh, yeah. e even so, even so there, the birds were having a buffet, they were still, there were still so many yeah. and the noise was deafening um yeah it, yeah yeah it's wild it's it's a wild experience for for about a month month and a half yeah man well well good luck in uh 2038 when i'll be back they'll yep. be coming around again you'll have everything everything ready yeah i was gonna say uh, come in, come 2038 i mean if you put your yeah your your future you hat on do you have any other questions that you would like to uh, investigate when it comes to soil hydrology with with uh, cicada emergence uh, i would love to get some groundwater wells in um mm. I, I would love to get uh, since i know where they're at i'd, I'd love to get mm -hmm. um some soil moisture sensors that go a little deeper in the landscape and actually see what right. happens to soil moisture during during precipitation events and right. um right. so the these uh the questions are endless now that we know a little bit more about what they do um we can be a little bit more prepared right. for this even though we had 17 years to be prepared for it we <laughs> we still we still had to rush it through. Right. All right. Well, I'm sure we'll be in touch then. Yes. Um, yeah. When that comes around. So go ahead and get the equipment ordered now. <laughs> That's right. Get it ordered <laughs> now. Have it sit around. Yeah. Uh, for 17 years. Um, I don't think our warranties last that long. Oh, but. okay. <laughs> we have to renew that one. Um, yeah. Um, all right. Uh, so let's, let's switch gears one final time here. Um, you had a uh, a project a couple years ago that you're working on. Um, in dealing with uh, crowdsourcing and citizen science when it comes to um, hydrology and just looking at watershed data. Um, can you talk about that little, is it, is it the, the Boyne River mm -hmm. Research Project? Is that, is that correct? Did yep. I pronounce that right? Yep. Yeah, so the Boyne River Research Project. Um, yeah, can you go into a little detail about, about that project, how it started, and, and why you were looking to use uh, a citizen scientist? Um. Yeah, it was in the Boyne River. This was a, a, a river in northern Michigan, kind of the same types of rivers we just talked about. Lots of trout, lots of salmon, lots of people mm -hmm. spending money to fish on this. Mm -hmm. um, and we, I worked with some people out uh, at uh, crowdhydrology.com, where most of this information come from. And we kind of got an idea. It's like, okay, so the USGS, they do a really good job of measuring stream flow and water temperature, but they can't do everything. Mm -hmm. And they, they can't get really get these smaller rivers. So what would, what would happen if we installed some citizen science measurements, uh, citizen science devices? Um, and these device, it's a ruler in a river. That's all it really is. Mm, it's okay. a ruler in a river yeah. on, on a piece of wood. And the, the top of the ruler says, call, text this number with the, the, the height of the water. Uh -huh. um, what we did a little unique with this project is that we also installed uh, digital thermometers as well. Um, so okay, there'd be right. two, two poles in the water. One said, what's the water temperature? And there's a, a digital screen that says, you know, whatever, whatever temperature it is. Mm -hmm. And both of these have signs that say, send this data to, uh, text, text us this information that gets cataloged somewhere and it just waits on us to do something with it. Right. Um, so at the same time, we were developing one of these hydrological models, um, for the Boyne river. Um, and the, really the research question is, can we use this citizen science data? for hydrological modeling. Usually we right. use USGS data um, because it's it's reliable, it's accurate, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, it, and we were successful, right? We, so we, we got a lot of these citizen science measurements and we used these citizen science measurements. Uh, we didn't get a lot of them, um, but there's certainly enough um, to do what we wanted to do. So we integrated mm -hmm. these measurements into a hydrological model. The model was relatively accurate and we were we could do some things with this model. And w what we did was we developed a website to where we would forecast the stream flow and the water temperature for the up to seven days in advance, you know, not mm -hmm. too different than what you're seeing on the phone with the weather um, to right, where yeah. the local community can, can click on a particular day and seeing what the water temperature is, is going to be uh, in, in a particular stream reach, you know, five days from now. Um, so ultimately it worked. Uh, you know, the, the main issue with this type of work is the uncertainty of the data. With, mm -hmm. with the USGS, you know, mm -hmm. you 
you know what you're getting and it's pretty reliable but here we were getting uh we know we, we know that the um we know that the water level is not 15 feet you know we know <laughs> we know that so we'd have to throw that information out uh right. i would have uh people send me pictures of of the uh of the gauges is not not what i wanted um right. but um we would get a lot of uh, different different types of data that we, we couldn't use. And mm -hmm. if someone sent us a, a data that was one foot, that's mm -hmm. a reasonable number. Um, right. We don't know right. if that's right or, or whether it's wrong, but something that we right. had to account for when we're developing these hydrological models um, of, of this region. So, so yeah, so a, a, a couple, well, first question, yeah, do you, I mean, do you bake some, some I guess, uh, some variability into into that model when you're dealing with with yeah. those, those data. Yeah. So what we we did a, a data simulation technique, and we can assume some uncertainty associated with that. Right. Um, yeah. I, I don't remember what number we used, but you know, think about plus or minus ten percent, or you know, whatever right. whatever that is. We can kind of bake that in, which it, it's it's useful when you're working with this type of data to do something like that because right. um, you don't know what you're getting. Right. Yeah. And I think with any kind of forecasting models or, or any, anything along those lines, I mean, we're dealing with probabilistic models where, where you're get, you're dealing with a range of certainties. Mm -hmm. And so, yep. so yeah, even for, even for, like you mentioned, you know, our weather forecasts or whatever that you might say, oh, you know, the weather channel says it's going to be a high of this and this, but they're, they're basically ta taking that, you know, that mean, um, or whatever yep. it may be of their models and saying, Hey, this is our, our, you know, uh, 95% certainty or something along those lines. Yeah. So yeah, all, all that kind of stuff is, is kind of baked in that we take for granted when we're, when we're dealing with models on a, on a daily yeah. basis. Yeah. I mean, that, that's essentially what we had to do. Yeah. You know, we knew yeah. roughly, roughly from previous work, we knew what the uncertainty should be and we could kind right. of bake that in and if right. people could be around a range rather than the, an exact value. Right. Yeah. And if you were if you were to do this again or revive it or, you know, do it somewhere uh, there in Indiana, um, what are what are some of the improvements that you think you could make in dealing with kind of crowdsourcing uh, citizen science data? Well, where we worked with uh, in, in Boyne, we worked with a, a community within Boyne called the Friends of the Boyne River, and they are mm -hmm. heavily invested in the Boyne River. Mm -hmm. So they would yeah. go out and take measurements uh, for us a lot. All right. So. One of the things that we learned from this type of type of study is you can't just pick another watershed. Um, okay. You you need to have a community that cares about the river, uh, yeah. because if they don't, uh, then you're not going to get any measurements. So there's really no use of you being there. All right. right. So we right. we targeted the Boyne River because we had worked with, or some of us have worked with the friends of the Boyne River who would we know that they would they paddle the river all the time, they clean up the river all the time. Um, mm -hmm. So we developed a relationship with them prior to even starting to study. So if I were to pick a, a watershed in Indiana, we would need to do the exact same thing. Um, like right. I said, otherwise, if, if the citizens aren't taking observations, there's no citizen science going on. Um, right. So there's yeah. just no point. So that's kind of yeah. the bit, the big take home message there. Great. Um, we're getting close to our time. Any, any final thoughts for our audience about, about stuff that you're working on or um, or anything that we've talked about? No, I mean, I think we've mentioned a lot. A lot of the stuff that we've talked about are kind of still going. Um, for mm -hmm. example, the rain on snow that we mentioned earlier on, there was some of this st is still going on. Um, citizen science, we're always trying to bring up. We, we're, we've always talked about going out to the Yellowstone and doing something very similar. Mm -hmm. um, to look at a different research question, out there it's flooding. Uh, in northern Michigan, it's more species, aquatic species. Um, right. So yeah, a lot of these, um, a lot of these projects that we talked about are kind of they're still going on, um, and some future research projects were are usually largely dictated by the students that I work with, their mm -hmm. their interest, and they may not be interested right. in in flooding. They may be interested in drought, and we'll go we'll go that direction with them. So right, right, awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and if uh, anybody in our audience wants to find out more about the stuff that you're working on, where might they be able to go? You can always send me an email at dficklin, D-F-I-C-K-L-I-N at indiana.edu. Um, I don't know what social media exists at this point. <laughs> right now it's X. I don't know what it'll be, but I am, I am D underscore Ficklin at, uh, on Twitter X. Uh, if you want to find me there, um, then we can maybe talk, talk elsewhere. Um, 
Um, so that those are the main ones. Send me an email. Always happy to chat um, about these projects and, and get something going. Okay, awesome. Well, our time is up for today. Thanks again, Darren, for being with us. We really appreciate you taking time to talk with us today. Um, I know I've enjoyed the discussion. I hope that those in our audience um, have as well. Had a great time. Thank you for having me. Stay safe, and we'll see you next time on We Measure the World.